I'm Duncan McLeod, and uh, you're joining us for episode three of Everything PC, a new podcast from Tech Central, where we delve into everything that's happening in the PC industry worldwide, looking at some of the history, some of the big players in the space, and in season one specifically, we're having a look at um, at the semiconductor companies and uh, so the, their, their fortunes and mishaps uh, over the last little while and where, where things are going. And uh, in this collaboration, this Everything PC podcast, my co-collaborator is Gerard Pretorius and he joins me now. Gerard, it's good to see you again. How are you doing? Yes, exciting as always. Excellent. Well, first two episodes, in case you missed them, we do recommend you go back and listen to those because we are kind of doing this as a, as a series and we... We, uh, we're going to talk a lot about, a lot of this, of course, is interrelated, and certainly the, the subject of our first four episodes are two companies that are very interrelated, in, Intel and AMD. We covered AMD in quite a lot of detail in episodes one and two, and episodes three and four, uh, we are going to take a deep dive into the Intel Corporation, which is uh, often referred to as Chipzilla, one of the big, uh, big, if not the biggest player, certainly historically the biggest player in the semiconductor industry. I think it could be probably disputed now about who the really who really is the biggest player in the semiconductor market. But a big important company that's kind of lost its way a little bit in the last uh, few years. And we're gonna we're gonna de- delve uh, into some of that that detail and and look at uh, what's happened with the company, why it's had had some strategic blunders in recent years, and whether its new CEO Pat Gelsinger is um, is the right man to turn it around. We're gonna deal a lot with that sort of the current and future looking stuff for Intel in, in episode two. But we're going to start today with having a look at the history of Intel, where it's come from, its role in the semiconductor industry, its role in the PC industry, and um, and, and really how it's actually changed, it, how it, it is one of the fundamental players in, in IT. Started all the way back, Gerard, in 1968, founded by Gordon Moore, of course, of Moore's Law fame, and his colleague Robert Noyce, and... Um, Robert Gordon Moore is a chemist, of all things, and uh, Rob, Robert Noyce is a physicist and co-inventor of the integrated circuit. Um, and they started a company uh, called uh, NM Electronics back in 1968, which would very soon be renamed Intel Corporation. And uh, a couple of years after that, they launched the first commercially available microprocessor. And that, uh, if you don't know, is the Intel 4004. Uh, that was launched in 1971, and they've, after that, they've really gone on Gerard, to reshape or define the PC industry and the microprocessor industry yeah. and effectively invented it. Well, they basically, I would say, inventing is a bit it's too much credit <laughs> for them, but right. they certainly mm, they d- certainly found a niche and went for it. So yes. that's just, now we're going back to the old IBM days where... Yeah. IBM's main failure there was they didn't really, f- they, their focus was too much on the data center and not consumer, yeah. where Intel yeah. then made a consumer chip that they could mass produce at, at a fairly decent scale in those times. In those mm-hmm. times, compared to what they made, the amount of chips they made then till now is, yeah, it's a joke. Like your, yeah. your modern day Chinese company that makes a toy makes more processor than what Intel did in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was it was it was groundbreaking stuff that yeah, Intel four zero zero four chip. So their main attribute there was manufacturing. So mm-hmm. this is one thing I should maybe start with with Intel. Intel predominantly, first and foremost, was a manufacturing company. Yeah, they are good at manufacturing chips, and you can still see that today. They are still regarded as one of the biggest guys that make chips. They ship the most amount of chips out. Massive company. There's the 4004 that they they produced in in, uh, 1971. Looks nothing like uh, a microprocessor as you'd know today, of course. I mean, look at those those arms that's sitting on top of there uh, that would then connect to... uh, What would that connect to in 71? Uh, Some sort of uh, early motherboard? Yeah, no, it's all early motherboards. You can either get, well, it's either a socket. In those days, it was all just soldered straight to the boards and so forth. Now, you'll see if you right. look at some of the websites that do like retro fixes and so forth, they'll actually have like a small little plastic thing with holes in it that you just, you can have socket the CPU in and take it out, in and out now the whole time. Right, right. But yeah, in those days, it was just literally like, just have that amount of holes, put it through, solder it, out, done. 
Yeah. And yeah, then yeah. from that chip, we can then lead to the, as we discussed in the AMB show, the Clone Wars, where mm-hmm. everybody made copies of those type of chips from Intel. Then AMD, when was that? Well, basically AMD get access to x86 as that matured from that architecture so that because mm. i think that was one of the mandates from ibm that ibm told intel that there has to be a second source for chips because we can't just rely I was on wondering intel. how that's yeah i was wondering how that started because i was actually reading um an article on this before the show um and i saw that they've got this sort of never-ending um ip sharing agreement yeah. uh, where, where they're allowed to cr- cross share or cross-license yes. uh, the technologies so, they develop, and so, it's in perpetuity. So the IBM was the origin. Yes, IBM was the guy that mandated Intel, where it's like, no, if you're going to buy chips from Intel, we need to have a second source, because right. if you die, what happens then? We're screwed. Okay. Or maybe okay. you get attacked, or maybe there's a design flaw. Have, Fascinating. Don't put all your chickens in, <laughs> or all your eggs in one basket, because if it fails, it can catastrophically fail. And again, that's now yeah. a testament to IBM's we scale for data centers. And there are, only two, there are only two ways that that agreement can be cancelled. Did you know this? Yes. Um, either, either AMD goes bankrupt. Yeah. <laughs> or someone acquires them. Or the share controlling shareholder changes in, in, in AMD. Yes. If one of those two happens, Intel is entitled to uh, yeah. no, cancel, I, cancel I, the agreement. I, I, I assume from now onwards they can probably battle that a bit more. But I think mm. Intel is like, that's why you could... Intel has no desire for AMD to fail, even when AMD was yeah. at their lowest point, because they want AMD, yeah. they want someone there that's complacent and weak, that can't mm. catch up to them, so that they have monopoly. Yes. So Yes, and of course AMD is catching up to them, but... Uh, oh, yeah, no, that <laughs> was gonna... that kind of like completely, yeah. you can, in retrospect, you can say that kind of bite Intel in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hardcore yeah. that they um, left AMD and oh no, AMD will never be able to match us blah 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 and then poof, 20 <laughs> years later oopsie yeah 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 um, but we're, we're gonna we're gonna deal, deal with that in fact we've dealt yeah. with how well AMD is doing yeah. in, in uh, our previous podcast but we're gonna have a look at how uh, how Intel under Pat Gelsinger is responding to that challenge um, but we are going to deal with that mostly, as I say, in episode four, part two of this this episode. But just going back to some of the history, so they, they introduced the the the, the four double oh four in nineteen seventy one. Uh, of course, a lot of water under the bridge over the over the next ten years or so as, as the company developed and expanded into new product areas. Yeah. But it was in the nineteen eighties that they really started to um, to become a big dominant company, where they where they started to develop the chips that were used in both IBM and IBM compatible yeah. clone. Uh, PCs um, and and people uh, old enough like you and me will remember these chips like the 8086 and the 286 and the 386 and the 486 um, and, and the and the various um, um, uh, sub chips if I could call it yes, that, yeah, all, well, all the different, all the different, different they put iterations out. that they've made because some of those mm-hmm. are improvements of others and then you had yeah. them well I think what's it going deep into the Clone Wars. So we had Motorola yeah. making chips, we had Toshiba making chips, we've got AMD making mm. chips, we've got Intel making chips. You've got all the old, most of those old companies all dead. So there's IBM yeah. PCs, mm. we had uh, Sinclair there, we've had, uh, what's the other company now? The name escapes me. Commodore. Commodore. Um, what's the other one? Amiga. Uh, Amiga, yeah. yeah. That's now where all those people would buy from Intel, from AMD, from Motorola, all those chips. And that's now when yes. the PC war started. And that's where right. you could see kind of, especially with Commodore coming in and so forth and Amiga, IBM struggled to really got, get the ball rolling. And mm. then they started with the old, deck, what's it, the PC Junior, that was kind of yes. and yeah. then iterations of that. But now through that, through Intel selling all of those things, Intel learns how to you can see how they started to see how they can outposition themselves with other companies. Because later on yep. those years, as we get to the 90s, you can see how Intel mm. cuts all those corners off so that mm-hmm. they become like, we are the company that does everything. So they do it through yep. either buying or suing them to say, you're using x86, you're not allowed to use x86 anymore. That's, 
yeah, so there's a lot of legal problems that happen in those time periods where Intel started to cut down to say, we, we need to make sure we make this niche because if we don't, one of our competitors can overtake us and kill us, basically. Right. So they just right. went super aggressive and made sure... It became extremely dominant in that yeah, period. Um, I mean, AMD, AMD had some success in the late 1990s, but right through the 80s and, 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 the, and the 1990s, um, PCs... Uh, were synonymous with Intel and, of course, Microsoft on the software side with with DOS and then Windows. Yeah. Um, but when you went to buy a PC in the eighties and nineties, you you were buying a, P, a PC with with Intel with inside. Intel, yeah, and it's basically mm. because a, at that stage, very really quickly, Intel made sure that they can out manufacture all the other guys. They can out manufacture right. AMD. They can out manufacture Toshiba. They can out manufacture Motorola, specifically so that they can. Set their dominance. And they spent in. a lot. They sp- yeah. spent a lot of money yeah. building fabrication plants. And to their credit, across the world, uh, to yeah. the credit, they pioneered. They out manufactured a lot of those companies. Mm. So that's where we, we were normally a pioneering th- smart w- company in those days. That's yeah. why Moore was a chemist. There's a lot of the stuff that's to do with chemistry, chemicals, and all right. that type of jazz. And then you need a CPU right. designer and all those things. So to make a CPU, you need a lot of different fuels to actually. Mm, communicate with one another and so forth. The mm. thing that sets mm-hmm. it apart is Intel, not too early, but you can start seeing closer on. They started to get people that was really good with management in terms of in terms of logistics and distribution. So getting parts, where they need to go, at what time, getting those channels set in. Because again, a lot of those things had to be either was manufactured in America, but the thing is, you're not just selling a CPU to them. You have to sell all the other mm. different things that go with it. Either in those days, they still had what's a coprocessor. So you had like yes. a mathematical processor specifically or this type of processor mm. that accelerates these specific workloads. So you need to now make sure that you can, if it's now Dell or HP in the early days and so forth, Communicate with these guys, manufacture the right amount of stock, get it delivered to where they need it in terms of where they need for manufacturing, what was either in America or in China and so forth. In the early days, most of those things were made in America, funny enough, like the Amigas Mm. and the Commodores. So, But it's still, you need to get a truck, manufacture it on time, get it on a truck, send it to them. They need to put it in. How do you help them to make it sure that the packaging is done? How to do the designs? Hence why we have the Intel ATX standards, which Intel still kind of is the seating position. So now we mm. see this with the new ATX standards that's coming out for the new PCI Express 5 graphics card. Intel pioneered that field of ATX, how to make ATX a standard, where everybody mm-hmm. has the same thing so that it's easier for Intel to kind of dominate, but it's also helping them in terms of Okay, now they don't have to figure out how to make power supplies and all that jazz. Intel's already done the work for us, so we could just copy it. Yeah, yeah. So Intel in those yeah. early days, again, to Intel's credit, they did a lot of work <laughs> to do that, which is pioneering in their fields. And it's yes. not just power supplies. They did motherboard designs. What shape motherboards? Even the ATX standard that we use for motherboards. Intel made that, mm. and Intel standardized mm-hmm. that, that we use today. Mm. So... Yeah, it's it's the I would say the good old days of very aggressive Intel being very pioneering. Mm, mm. Yeah, I mean, I I I, um, I don't know how old you are, Gerard, but I, I kind of my formative years with computers was in the nineteen eighties. Um, it's when I was in in school, and I I went through all of these processes uh, generations that Intel that Intel brought out. And every time we moved up from the eight oh eight six to the, um, in fact, we I think we had the eight oh eight eight, which was a very similar chip. Um, then to the two eight six, the three eight six, and the four eight six. Each time we moved to a new uh, generation of Intel chip, there was a massive performance yeah. improvement. Not 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 the sort of improvements you see between core generations today. No, um, no, no we're no. talking massive, yeah. massive improvements. Uh, uh, and there was incredible innovation going on at the time. Yeah, no, and, and most of that innovation and performance came from design. So yeah. manufacturing, not. Let me rephrase it. Not specifically design, mainly in we can make the transistors more dense. Mm-hmm. So it's purely manufacturing lead. So even if Intel had, let's say if it was a proper competitor, they, Intel would still have won because their chip, the actual manufacturing process, was, manufacturing method was m- more mature and 
more advanced than what all yeah. the other companies had. Yeah, yeah. Were they using um, um, more advanced nodes than their competitors? Kind of, but it's what also... Was the, it's, what was the advantage they really had? It's what mainly was the just in terms of manufacturing to scale and then manufacturing in terms of okay. quality control. So they had better okay. yields. They could just out-manufacture that. So you can see... It, they could do it cheaper. Cheaper as well, but it's also the quality. Like the Intel chips mm. were more reliable. They lasted longer. Yeah. So yeah. you can yeah. see later on where AMD started to get really aggressive, that kind of, you could see that competition there. But mm. still then, I would say it's only really now that Intel's dominance, I would say about now, mm. about three years ago, that Intel lost the dominance in CPU manufacturing. Yeah. But for the that, 80s and 90s were definitely their, their, their um, strongest period. Yes, no, the manufacturing, they were just pioneers in and this manufacturing. Was the, this was the era when Gordon Moore was CEO, yeah. and then, uh, of course, Andy Grove took over, I think, in the late 80s, and he was yeah. CEO for about 10 years um, before he, he had, uh, unfortunately, hit health troubles. Um, but uh, incredibly, incredible pioneers in this industry. I mean, Moore was, of course, the, he's, of course, the name behind the famous Moore's Law, yes. which we all know, and, um, and, and and Andy Grove was an early employee. He wasn't one of the co-founders, but he was an early employee. Uh, he was a, a refugee, I think, uh, from... Uh, the refugee from the Nazis, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so well, that's now, now. Yeah. The, you could say the old guard, but they were all engineers, yeah. so they knew mm. what needed to do, be done. Because it was aggressive yes. in those times. You couldn't just sit yeah. and sit in your chair and chill. You yeah. had to work yeah. for every inch. And they were yeah. also, to Moore's credit, they knew where the weaknesses were and targeted yeah. them deliberately yeah. to make sure that they will have a very proper future. And then also in that sense... They kind of wanted to go toe to toe to IBM. So when they can attack the mainframe and take over server is the big one. Right, servers. Yeah. Once yeah, you take yeah. server, server computing. That's where the money sits. A server. You can ask any yeah. company. A server is where you yeah. make your stupid money. Yeah, and that's a, that's about a third of Intel's, a third to about forty percent, I think, of Intel's revenue yeah. today comes from. From data center. It's difficult um, because the problem is they, it's not just that. Because in data center mm. and so forth, your advantage is also in terms of R&D that you don't really pay yeah. for. So mm -hmm. because you're working with all of these companies, they give you feedback. And that feedback is worth millions. I'm mm -hmm. not joking. When I tell you it's like getting feedback from Dell and HP when they do their service and they test their software on it, then Intel can go back and in their design and change stuff and so forth to make it more proficient in there. So... Yeah. That even that they they make a stupid money from them, and then those people help them to make even more money in terms of mm, mm. that R and D cost. They don't have to actually mm. go figure it out. They can just go, oh, these guys already kind of already found where we need to go, found the breadcrumbs, and then we need to just fix this and this and this, and then there you go, extra five percent mm. or ten percent of performance. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to remember the exact timeline here, but uh, we went 286, 386, 6, and then there was no 586. That became what was known as, and this is when Intel abandoned that old numbering scheme, and they introduced a chip called the Pentium. Yes. Um, and this was also, the, if I recall correctly, around the time that Intel hit, hit its first major uh, crisis. Got uh, yes. Because there was a major problem with the Pentium chip. Um, it couldn't add numbers or something. Um, yes. what, was the, what was the story there? Do you well, recall what happened? As far uh, as I know, Pentium it's to floor? do with the, um, the actual m mathematical processing in there. So how okay. it does add, subtract, and multiply and so forth. That did it wrong. So when you give it a bunch of numbers and you tell it to do these, all these instructions and so forth, yeah. It would add, and to its own mind, it says, no, but what I'm adding is correct, but it would actually add digits to it. And yes. yeah, when you do that, people are not, people don't buy processes that give you different answers every time you ask it. Yeah. People yeah. want to buy a processor that gives you the same answer every time, no matter how many times you ask. So... There we go. There we go. The Pentium FD4, FDIV, I think it's FD4 bug is a hardware bug affecting the floating point unit of the early Intel Pentium processors. Yeah. Because the bug, the processor would return incorrect binary floating point results when dividing certain pairs of high precision numbers. Um, and it was a massive, I remember this, it was in the headlines for months oh, yes. and no, months. This and was months. a massive kerfuffle. It's like yeah. massive egg in the face. Because it's like, <laughs> how did you miss this? And it's one of those things where it's like, 
probably with the chips they made somehow were not affected and then when they mass produced it, it there was some issue with mass production that completely reared his head and yeah that's why you spend a lot of money to design chips to make sure this doesn't happen because this yeah. is a lot of money yeah. to go and literally make a new chip because if you dial HP or IBM and though they oh well, I don't know if IBM was really fluent in those days anymore but Dell and HP they would literally just send you the mm. chip back and say where's my new chip thank you yeah. and <laughs> it's, it's, yeah you had to know on your own cost give them new CPUs and so forth so luckily they mm. couldn't weather the storm with that one because they've already by that time accumulated a lot of money so they could yeah. absorb that as a and then again they probably have insurance for that type of disasters or whatever yeah so yeah, yeah that was, was an interesting time that was one of the first major kerfuffles they had with yeah, design yeah. and then uh, uh, then we get to netburst which is another yeah. ish in a moment for them and then netburst i don't remember that one what what happened there that was their different architecture where they tried to do a clustered architecture where okay. so it was basically i don't think they really released that from what i remember but basically instead of having what we now have one core two core three core it tried it's basically imagine you would Try and make a GPU, a CPU, yeah, with hyperparallelization, and that failed miserably because, first of all, GPUs weren't really a massive thing by then, so people didn't really know how to program for a hundred cores or fifty cores or anything like that. They were just like, blah, blah, what the hell? And then that whole architecture, in principle, was very nice, but it only worked on a piece of paper. It didn't actually work in real life. And mm -hmm. that failed miserably. And Netburst also then led to... Netburst, what did Netburst lead to? Let, net, let, Netburst led to... I think basically after that, they had Pentium, Netburst, Netburst was a fail, Titanium, and then the core processor started. And that's... Oh, the Titanium, that was the development with HP to develop 64-bit chips, yeah, right? Yeah, that's when Intel now started yep. to say, we're going to do 64-bit. And as we said in the AMD one, then AMD made this cross-compatible. You didn't have to make yes. a chip that's 32-bit and I have to have a chip that's 64-bit. You can actually have one chip that can do both. And then right. Intel kind of like, oh, didn't think about that though, did we? And then, <laughs> yeah, AMD then, that's also the other m marriage that we spoke about where because AMD used Intel's x86 to make 64-bit, in, in AMD had to give it to them but they had to license mm -hmm. it now from AMD. So hence they are now in mm. lic licensing harmony. One cannot go without the other one now. So if AMD yeah, dies, yeah. AMD 64-bit dies, which Intel can't do because if that dies, uh, yeah. big problem. These two companies really are joined at the hip, oh, aren't they? <laughs> yes. No, that's, again, it's kind of to our benefit. It's, I think as far as I know, mm. Bill Gates' original idea was to make sure that, and, even the hard times of AMD, you can see there was a lot of people funding the money just to keep them afloat because they didn't want mm -hmm. Intel to be dominant. Because yes. if we now go on from now from those chips, I don't even know how you would describe it. The litigations that Intel have gone through is just, yeah. I think, from what I remember... They play dirty, right? Oh, no. Uh, let me put it like this. There has been lawyers that has worked for Intel on one case... And they've worked on that one case so long that they have retired. <laughs> a lawyer that's on Basically their one entire case working career on and they have retired doing one job <laughs> on one case. That's how long yeah. some of those suits are. And again, Intel, yeah. you must give them kind of kudos for being such a massive dick to be that aggressive. <laughs> mm. <laughs> to... Like in what were, what were some of these lawsuits about? Though? I mean, oh, what, what were oh, they objecting well, to? So it's basically going from yeah. basically doing the old thing where you buy a company and then steal the talent beforehand and then buy the company and then somebody will sue you. The big ones we will probably know of and heard will hear of is basically in terms of how they spend money with literally go to companies and say, don't buy AMD. Like mm. here's a bucket mm. load of cash. Don't buy AMD chips. Even if you lose Good money, point. even if we lose money, don't buy AMD. Now, Dell, I would say, is probably the most known one because 
I know the okay. Americans got went after them quite hardcore on that one. Because at some point, it's stupid. It's like Intel couldn't afford to buy AMD chips. Because if they did, they would lose money. Even if AMD gave it to them for free, they were so <laughs> dependent on Intel's rebate system. And this is now where the other big boo thing comes from. Intel mm -hmm. dominated the rebate system. And most companies mm -hmm. are copying their rebate system. And it is a in my personal opinion, a very dirty trick. Mm -hmm. Because it's basically mm -hmm. going to the company saying, you are contractually abiding to buy X amount of chips per quarter. Mm -hmm. If you do not, if you can't sell them, your problem. If you don't next quarter mm -hmm. buy more chips or the same amount of quantity, we will cut you in financial size. So you kind of have to buy, let's say you have to buy a million chips a quarter. You have to buy a million. So you have to somehow sell those things. So if you've got AMD coming there trying to give you chips and say tell sell us like mm. no the market isn't big enough we can only sell Intel once because if you don't we don't make money. Yeah, yeah. And that's that. And it was very often, very often. I mean, Intel was so dominant back in those days that, um, and, and of course Microsoft was so dominant as well. They just they'd, they'd come through the I mean, MS DOS era. Microsoft did the they same. Were, <laughs> <laughs> they were. I mean, Microsoft was was. I mean, they were they were uh, they were in a lot of trouble. Oh no, they were ruthless. Authorities. Bill Gates was not. Um, that was in his ruthless age when he was young yeah. and aggressive. He wasn't an ask. He wasn't an ask oh, guy back no, then. Oh, he was a. But, uh, well, again, yeah. you must give credit. Eh? I would say mm, he was at least a bit more tactical about it. He didn't really right. do like Intel, where they literally just say bribe people. Mm -hmm. He would <laughs> literally outsmart the enemy, and the enemy would be kind of about it and then again you can see in them doing a bit of like you're being a bit misguided and you're like yeah you're trying to control the narrative in your specific way because you know if you can control that narrative they can't do that mm. so it mm. that's why it was difficult for microsoft to get microsoft guilty on those cages because they weren't mm. deliberately doing it it's more like the mm. here's the carrot and we're not telling you to do it but Mm -hmm. I see you with my eye and ink, ink, nudge, nudge, you can, yeah, without saying it. Yeah. Whereas Intel literally went, yeah. no, like, here's our documents, we will screw you over. Uh, yeah. You see, that kind of Intel was a bit too bullish for that one. And there's still cases they going on. They were investigated for it. They were investigated oh, no. for it. They, 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 they took Japan, mm. the European one, I think the European was one was still going on. I think they now closed it off now where... I think everybody just got, got tired because that one, I think on, right? the European one that they have there has been sitting in EU law now for close to 25 years. Good grief. I'm like, Good grief. imagine how much Intel has spent on lawyer money Toys. for that one case. Mm. I'm like, <laughs> seriously? Like, was it really that worth it? How much? And it's not like, and even I can remember some of the stuff where it's like, even when the American government would like, like have things against them and so forth. Then it's like, oh, you've got the American justice system and they'll have like four lawyers and then it's literally Intel would rock up there with 25 lawyers. Yeah. And then it's like, yeah. holy yeah. c***. <laughs> they're coming prepared. Yeah. And they, because again, some of those lawyers pretty much knew what they did and it's like, okay, how can mm. we mitigate this so that we don't get, what points can we do to mitigate this so it's not as bad or how can we make this mm. thing fail? So that they lose this mm -hmm. lawyer case. So it's not like, oh, we're innocent. No, no, no. How can we make sure that this case dies? Yeah. Which is again, yeah. it's like, what? Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Obviously, it paid off because Intel. It's still a Intel's still a massive company now. Like, how many trillions mm. are they? Like seventy-one trillion dollars a year. They're still massive. Billion, billion. I think. I don't think there's. I don't I think it's trillion. trillion but yeah, actually, yeah. Let me. Um, how much are they worth? Because it's. About two, three hundred billion dollars, I think, is their market cap at the moment. They're yeah. just ahead of AMD, which is sitting on about two seventy. Yeah, but it's um, in terms of actual IP because Intel's IP is worth like. Uh, Let's I have a look have at their annual revenue figure. Yeah. Um, so here we go. Twenty twenty one sales of seventy nine billion dollars, yeah. up from seventy billion in twenty eighteen. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, market cap two hundred ninety five billion dollars. Yeah, so they are still worth. So they're a big company. They're, they're a, big a company. massive um, company, and they've got a crap load of employees. I think there's not a lot of companies. Yeah, I think it's like over a hundred thousand. Microsoft, that type of amount of employees. 
I don't think there's yep. any other, not even Apple have that amount of employees. No, Apple's a much smaller company in terms of employees, yeah. but not in terms of revenue. No, yeah, um, well, uh, <laughs> we'll get to that on the later episode. <laughs> <laughs> but 121,000 employees as of 2021. Yeah, no, that's yeah. a lot of people to Big employ. Company. Jeez, that's, uh, that's, that's like you can almost start your own small little country. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to look up an Apple in Wikipedia, but it's uh, bringing up a picture of an actual Apple. Oh, joy. Uh, <laughs> Google for the win. <laughs> Apple Incorporated. Here we go. Um, number of employees. So they, Apple's revenue in 2021 was $366 billion. Yes. So that's significantly it. bigger than Intel. Yeah. Um, and their number of employees is 154,000. And they're actually bigger than Intel. 154,000. I didn't oh. realize Apple employed that many people. Yeah. Oh, well, they do smartwatches. They now do design. I wonder how many actually... Mm. Oh, maybe they count all the Apple stores as well, which is a bit cheating. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm that's sure maybe cheating a bit. I'm they, sure yeah, they do. That's not really fair. Um, uh, it's like how many people... And their market... <laughs> yeah. Their market cap, uh, Intel's market cap, 295 billion. Apple's market cap, 2.8 trillion. No, I don't know. That's, <laughs> uh, that, that's one thing. I'm like, <laughs> how can Apple be worth that much? It's like... Ten times as much as Intel. That's, um, but they're not in the same. They're not really in the same business. Again, I mean, it's like, Apple's a consumer-facing it's product. Probably right? software and people piping it up. It's like, well, it's like Tesla. How much worth is Tesla? I'm like, Tesla doesn't have the same amount of IP as even IBM. Uh, IBM is yeah. worth more money than all of those companies combined, even in my opinion. I, IBM has way more. Should IP. be. So again, yeah. it's mm, it, how you use the IP. It's, I suppose it's not just. Uh, it's how, how much people think it's valued at. You see, that's the problem. Yeah. And uh, yeah. like we've learned here now, people don't really know what it's actually worth. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's go back. Yes. We're, we're getting so, way off no, track. Oh, let's go back got, and talk we about… We actually uh, had a nice uh, link there because it's now market segue, caps and yeah. all that jazz because then we can move time. Mm. I don't know if you want to link that stuff. We, we now lead to market share in terms of CPU shares now. Now that you're going, yeah. Let's the, have a look at that. Yeah, let's have a look at that. Do you want to share up that uh, okay. that link uh, um, of the market share? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's interesting times because, um, because of course, we went from the Pentium, then there was a whole gener- a whole series of Pentium processes over a number of years, and then eventually, um, I forget what if there were brands after Pentium, but eventually we got to the core processes um, about uh, 15 years ago or so. Um, was there was there a, an Intel brand after Pentium? I'm trying to remember. Well, it's Pentium, now. and then it was basically the core architecture. So it was the core the architecture I, that came well, in after that. We would now would start. I think it was first core, and yep. then basically, I think it was the Q sixty six hundreds, and then we started with the i the i series. So i seven, i five, blah blah, and onwards. So mm-hmm. once they okay. So what are we what are we looking at here? So, Desktop market share. Intel versus AMD. Yeah. That's very interesting. So when we look when at does the, the start, two thousand and four. So in the early days of now, we're going Athlon and that type of era when it was highly competitive and so forth. I think the two thousand six is probably the peak point of what AMD had with Athlon and so forth. And then it's basically Intel, AMD also had Optron then with servers, which also were quite popular with server market. And then Intel did. Uh, I think that would probably start with the Haswell architecture there. So, so Intel's bouncing up now. Yeah, now that's now you can see here uh, um, Intel's um, manufacturing playing a big part here because Intel also had a massive bone with or boon with manufacturing capability. So this mm. is also also leading to AMD's problems, and then also this is also where the <clears throat> all those um, nice things happened with Intel where they would ask people not to do their stuff. Again, this is also a bit. <laughs> this is also a bit skewed because most of this would be yeah. more enthusiast i don't know if this counts actual like dell and hp and so forth because in those markets intel is still way ahead of amd yeah so this is but they've really dominated through the whole core series yeah of processes. so you're looking I mean, about from years. from here yeah, from the 2006 all the way to about i would say even 2019 most of the dominance yeah. set with intel with yeah. the normal desktop where we would our consumers that are gaming enthusiasts, this is mainly that market, mm-hmm. not the OEM okay. market and so forth, because those markets are... Which is the biggest market. The OEM, OEM market must like be by far the biggest. Massive laptops, yeah. government mm-hmm. stuff. AMD is 
probably like AMD's probably making some headway in it. I, I don't know the figures yeah. off the top of my head. I would say probably now closer to like maybe 15% now compared to what okay. they were. But on the desktop market, they've jumped considerably compared to where they were. So yeah. these are the old bad days when it was bulldozer and yeah, that and Intel AMD was literally on their knees here. The year yeah. in the 2010s, yeah. yeah, all the way, I would say, probably down, down to about 2014, they were at their worst, and then it got a bit worse, and then you'll see a start pick up here, that 2017, that's when Ryzen started to show its head. And I was about to say, is that the Zen architecture yeah, coming in? Yeah, that's Zen, and then mm -hmm. you can start seeing it going up, and then 2019, when we start seeing, seeing Zen 5, oh, well, Zen 3 come out, and then you can just start seeing how mm -hmm. that architecture just completely dominated with the improvements that they had with the chiplet feature and then now again there's some disparity now again because intel now has 12 gen so a bunch of 12 gen have been sold amd's probably lost again because uh it's intel has 12 gen so we'll see how this happens so what is that end of this year what's going to happen to that what's going to happen to that chart in the I, next it's two years? probably going to do a, another like get together again when we get to the end of the year, mm -hmm. when we get to AMD Zen yeah. 4 and so forth. So we'll probably see, depending on how things go, I think it's going to be much closer now. We're going to see that okay. line become still bouncy, but more in AMD might go up a bit more. So we'll see where it's going to be closer to that 50-50% mark, which is which is good. AMD, I and think, would want to go higher, but yeah. I would say your main focus there would be serving AMD and and do you think AMD is going to be more successful going forward in the OEM market, or do you think yes. Intel still has that stitched yeah, up? No, it's, I think, depending on how it handles, because OEM market is an interesting market, because especially now that COVID hit. COVID is the thing that mm -hmm. kind of threw everyone a bit off game, because most people expected demand to go down because people won't have money, but clearly that wasn't the case. People had a lot of money, and yep. they bought a lot. So... Mm -hmm. that's why Intel still makes a lot of money. Even now that we as enthusiasts critique them and say, what a crappy product, they still sell most of what they make. <laughs> Even though AMD is getting market share, Intel still selling most of the chips that they're making. So it tells you that because Intel kind of fumbled their manufacturing and couldn't manufacture more chips, because if Intel could manufacture more chips, they would have sold more chips. Because mm. AMD, if mm. AMD wasn't there, we would be in massive trouble. Because it would mean Intel mm. would like um, Intel would not be able to keep up. We would have literally like, oh yeah, for three months you wouldn't have Intel chips. Because yeah. Yeah. now that AMD is there, they can take up that slack where Intel now didn't didn't really push their manufacturing. Now AMD can step in and make all those sales, but even then, Intel still sells most of their chips. Which is good for yeah, Intel yeah. because it means, hey, <laughs> we're not actually losing as much as we thought they would because they would have looked way worse if if mm. Corona didn't pick up. AMD would have probably been on a much bigger market share now if Corona didn't pick up. But now, now you've got Intel growing and you've got AMD growing. It's a bit difficult then to say your market share grows with AMD, but the problem is your Intel market share also grows. But it's mm, difficult mm. to measure that, I think, with a lot of these things. It, and again, that's mostly OEM. Desktop consumer range is a bit more easier to bounce around because the volume you're selling there is less. But if you read Intel's market, their actual fund, um, their profit slides and shareholder slides and so forth, they're like, it's been a record year. We've sold more than what we did last year, even <laughs> by them losing market share. <laughs> like how does that happen like by losing you win <laughs> so <Interesting>. um, <laughs> or I would say win but you still kind of yeah. winning or not like breaking even I don't know they're still winning because they're making more money it just yeah, it sounds yeah. very weird now where we can say that but it's mainly due to COVID because when COVID hit everything mm -hmm. sold if it had a chip in it it sold AMD yeah. made it sold yeah. AMD had their own yeah. like, little freaking AMD chips that they had were left over they sold everything like yeah. some of the stuff are like literally AMD sold everything they had. Like, and like you've got, like, I think some of the suppliers stated to me that you, they were sold out so fast that even if you placed your order now, you had to wait three months for your stock to come. And even Intel was in that position where it's like, it's so bad. 
logistics there because now Intel could manufacture enough, but logistics getting packages and so forth. That's why you'll see a lot of companies mm-hmm. started selling OEM chips because Intel's like, we don't, the, the market is so big now and so grabby with chips. We can literally just send them the chips and not even send them the cooler with and just sell the chip and they'll still take it at the same price. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I thought it's been, it's been absolutely incredible to see what's happened over the last two years and the demand. I see just as a, as a, as an aside that, uh, the, the shortage of, um, GPUs seems to be ending at yes, last. No, uh, so prices are coming so down. We'll, we'll get that into part two when we talk about Intel's GPUs and so forth, but everything yeah. is getting better now. Finally, like yeah. it's getting better. Finally. It's not, it's better, but it's not where it was. <laughs> mm. it, we're still recovering and so forth, but it's yeah, getting there yeah. where we can say, ah, okay, we can now see the light at the end of the tunnel with that type of yeah, gas. Yeah. So, yeah. so basically to say, to continue with that type of stuff. So one of the... You are sharing our show notes with the oh, world. You're giving away our secrets. Oh, Get out. <laughs> I forgot. I should have shared the other window, not that one. Uh, no, it's cool. We can see how we do the podcast. <laughs> no, nah, that's fine. I should have shared another window. So, oh, that's not at the top. Because the thing I wanted to mention now, over those years that Intel would dominate, our biggest yeah. problem when Intel was dominant there is we kind of lost the innovation in terms of performance. Because between yeah. those years now, when you look at between, from now 2007 and eight and so forth, Till basically 2019, just before that, we were stuck with quad cores. Mm -hmm. You had now X99 that was server platforms with six cores and they could go up to eight cores, but they were phenomenally expensive. The big problem was OEMs as well. You had two cores with the i5 and the i7s, which were dual cores, which kind Mm -hmm. of screwed us over. And then amazingly, as soon as AMD starts being competitive, all of a sudden Intel can like, oh, no, all of a sudden there's six core processors. Oh, there's eight core processors. So yeah. all of a sudden Intel can just out somewhere, just it's like, oh, no, no, we, it became we've got these things. We, fat and lazy. We've, 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 we've done this. It's like, oh, no, no, we were, we were going to launch it. It's like, yeah, but you didn't. So that's kind of yes. my biggest problem with Intel, where Intel... They got fat and lazy and they didn't innovate Yeah, it's because they didn't have to. Yeah, you can't say that, but it's like, that's what yeah. happens when my biggest gripe with Intel and yeah. was in those days is you could see business people taking over. So it's purely yes. business guys where it's like, how can we milk everything? And that's why like, yes. you were, it's like the Darth Vader thing. You were the chosen one. Yeah. Intel, you like yeah. were all those guys. You were pushing, 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 and like, and now you've basically done the dark side thing, where you've now mm. done and made sure kill the competition, kill everything, make sure innovation you control it, and then drip feed it to people and say, oh look at this nice like freaking new quad core. And they, to Intel's credit, they did pioneer certain things with quad core, where they made the single cores quicker and quicker, quicker, but. In the mm. days we were used to, ah, oh, every year and a bit, we get like an extra 30% or 50% or in you know, the old days, like 100% or 80% quicker. It's like, yeah, oh, it's gone. Yay, 10%, 5%. Yeah. Woo. I'm yeah. like, ah, come on, man. It's. I remember through that period, and here's a picture on the screen, by the way, of Intel in that period. Uh, <laughs> I remember uh, back then, I, I didn't even care what generation yeah. core processor I was yeah, using it's anymore. It's like, I've got a fourth gen. I still have customers coming with fourth gen, only really now upgrading their sixth gen processor. Right. Sixth gen. We're talking about almost eight years ago now. Yeah. That yeah I'm like, yeah. oh, <laughs> that's bad. Now we're like, oh, yes. Now we already have like this chip, AMD. 12 gen and it's of oh, AMD Zen this and Intel 12. Now mm. you can see it's more aggressive and all of a sudden laptops are changing. So at that, it's exciting it's again. It's exciting. And that's how I'm like, mm. why is it always, and we will talk about that when we get to the NVIDIA one as well. It's It seems always, mm. it's only when AMD really starts gunning for it that everyone starts to run. Mm. And that mm. Mm. grinds my nerdy nah, so much. That they con- well done, not for not swearing. <laughs> it's like, why? It's like, why does AMD always have to be the guy that does it and not you guys? Mm. You guys that have the money, you guys that have the skill. Mm. And this also ultimately mm. led to their brain drain 
for Inter. Mm, mm. Because in those yep. time periods, a lot of guys left and just said, it's boring. Why am I still at this company? Yeah. No matter what I do. And that's one of the reasons they got into trouble, right? Well, I mean, they actually lost key exactly. talent. Exactly. So now that's now what happens yeah. there is you start to have that brain tank. And then that now leads to when you're in that period, when you've got stupid amount of money, you could yeah. see them starting to lose talent. And then what the marketing mm. or what the CEOs at the top think is just let's buy. Mm. So that's what you see mm. now. As I now tell people, it's like that it was now Intel's Babylon Tower moment where they just buy everything. Buy that, buy this, yes. buy this AI company, buy this company. We buy them. And they were buying all weird companies. Like, yeah. They bought McAfee. And like, and like, and like, like, it's actually ingenious why they bought them. Like You can see the actual businessman saying, oh, we buy them so that we force the OM to put McAfee on there and then we get the customer to pay a monthly subscription or yearly subscription to McAfee, which we make money from. So you mm -hmm. can see why they did that. <laughs> and it's like malicious as hell. <laughs> it's an accountant. Exactly. You thinking, can see. Not an uh, engineer. See, like, Don't <laughs> care about the chip. Like, the chip doesn't matter. The money makes matter. And it's like, even though it's mm. a terrible piece of crap software, like if you can, like the first thing you do with your Intel Horrible. system, uninstall McAfee, it's a piece of crap. Honestly, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, me as an IT person that work on a computer store, McAfee is a small little devil. Garbage. It's even worse than Clippy. Mm. It's it's <laughs> terrible. That thing will make your machine slower. <laughs> it's just like, no. And they still go with it. Right. I'm like, yeah. man, that's... And then you can see all the other companies, like highly good companies, like you bought them. What are you going to do with them? And they do nothing. I'm like, yeah. why? You buy all of these nice things. They bought a company that does... That does actually uh, freaking, uh, what is the processors now? Uh, let me open that quickly. Well, let's, Processors for? Well, basically, they did a bunch of processors for uh, the same as what uh, Xilinx made. Um, FPGAs. They oh, bought, sure. um, okay. what's the company? Something with an A. They bought them. And okay. we ex expected them to do all these great things. And... They, they did some nice things, but clearly not good enough for Xilinx to just take it and then just freaking go to the moon. Mm. So <laughs> what are you? What is Intel doing with all of these companies? And that's that's where mismanagement comes in again. They buy all of this. They're too much money sitting on their balance sheet. And they need this, it was burning all in their pocket. They're buying all of this talent and then doing nothing with it. Yeah. So that was my biggest yeah. disappointment with Intel. Where it's like you didn't have people in charge to know what you're buying and how to use it properly. And again, mm. uh, it, this is also to the shareholders because a lot of the shareholders mm. there are shareholders from Moore's family and their trustees and all those jazz. And they did not. Yeah. they also losing in this because Intel shares would have been higher now. They've lost a lot of their share in terms of value and all those things because Intel is now seen as a lesser company now. Mm. So mm. it's you kind of screwed yourself over. And the shareholders are... Also, especially the big players are also accountable to that because they should have yeah. seen this and say, hey, but what the hell's going up with management here? Like, you're making yeah. a lot of money here and so forth, but what are we buying and what are we spinning on? Yeah. And so this, I mean, this really happened. Uh, I mean, I've just thrown the, the CEOs. This excludes Bob Swan from 2018 and uh, and obviously Pat Gelsinger. Uh, so there's two more to that add to that list. But um, you had these engineers running the company all the way up to Grove. Was Barrett an engineer? I can't remember. Uh, I think he wasn't. Um, but certainly under Paul Ottolini and, and Brian Kranich, a lot of this uh, is when these acquisitions happened. Yeah, and, no, and a lot of the talent left the well, company. Well, Paul was the big guy that led the company in the, actually, I would say, in the dark days when Intel didn't innovate or do anything. And then Brian, yeah, yeah he just went with the, I wouldn't even say with he went with the boat basically. He didn't do steer yeah, it or anything. Yeah. He was just going with it and people, you did whatever you wanted. Management did whatever they wanted. And again, that's also where they a lot of the employees got unhappy with him. Especially when Brian mm. was in charge because they I'm not joking you, like retrenched a lot of people and just said, No, we'll yeah. just get temp or get temp workers from India and they'll do your job. <laughs> that we don't have to pay them because they tempt, so we can just fire them whenever we want to for to make the papers yeah. look good when financial India happens. We can just 
tank them for a month and then rehire them later. Yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. that's accountant speaking. Yeah, it's not like you being a massive. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not nice. You know, mm. being really deliberate in how you fudging your money, and and not paying people well. Now, when we get to the next episode, we'll talk about how Pat is doing a lot to fix that in a massive panic, <laughs> but I <laughs> will give him credit that he is. He is actually taking control of the actual rudder there now and mm. actually pointing yeah, the company yeah. in a proper position. Because yeah, yeah. yeah Intel so, Intel needs to be careful with AMD now. Yeah. So I yeah, would say AMD actually is, is, I wanna actually I don't know if we can put a link up or something. Well or you can maybe do that when we do in the description so forth. Especially from um the gent I actually linked in there. Because he is a former Intel engineer. Um, what's this thing here? Where is it now? Is that the video you yes. sent me before the show? Yeah. We will, we'll definitely yeah. link that up. Because we'll definitely he link is that an up. Intel and engineer. And he owns a lot of mm -hmm. shares as well. Because a lot of the Intel yeah. share engineers and so forth. Because he was one of the pioneers of the core architecture. So the yeah. dude, he's a French guy. He knows his stuff. Okay. And that is a great video of how he, he himself, an Intel guy, nails Intel. Like an not right. holding back at all. So it's a okay. nice video where people can say, okay, this is a guy within Intel pointing out all the failures of Intel inside. Yeah. And yeah. Even so I wanted to come back to I wanted to come back to something you mentioned because um uh, we, we know that in, Intel fumbled through this period and made some some big mistakes. Uh, and you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that one of the areas where they really fumbled was in in their manufacturing. Um, oh yes, their, we should actually. What 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 happened there? Why? Well, I mean, what? That's an interesting story. So basically, due yeah. to Intel's kind of just letting it go. So in that dark times, where engineers started to leave because Intel wasn't really pushing. Mm. TSMC start to do really push because a lot of the guys bought GPUs from them. So TSMC started to see some very significant growth in GPUs and so forth for high performance compute. Yeah. So yeah. when they started to get that, a lot of those Intel engineers left for them and started to help TSMC with their mm -hmm. actual products and design and all those things. And you could see a very advanced growth once they got over the 22 nanometer hurdle with TSMC Mm. 16, that improved drastically, and then they had another jump. But then also there as well is the time frame when um, ASML opened up and mm -hmm. said, okay, in, there's Intel, Samsung, and TSMC. You're the three biggest. You now own shares in our company because you, you buy most of the lithography machines we make. Here, here you go. So then what TSMC does, they literally just went and bought all the best machines out of Intel's noses. Because Intel was so high and mighty, like, like, mm. and they went just like, oh, aren't Intel buying this? Oh, okay, we'll take them. And they took all the best <laughs> EOV machines out of, from right. ES. So it's like, Intel. From ASML. Intel, yeah. like, w w what the hell, guys? Like, you seriously not going to, like, like buy on that? Like, no. That's why even in the old days, I thought people would say, why isn't Intel buying? Why is Intel stagnating in manufacturing? Because that is one of their cornerstones. So I tell people, Intel's cornerstones is basically manufacturing, distribution, and then the CPU. So before anything else, the CPU isn't the most important. The most important thing is manufacturing for Intel. And then the second thing is distribution. And then the CPU comes. Mm. The CPU is not that important for Intel anymore. Because they are over mm -hmm. on server and over on mass production for Dell, HP, Lenovo, all these guys. Because that will Im just imagine how many Intel chips Intel makes in a month. And they need to, mm -hmm. they have to do all the laptops, they have to do all the server, they have to do all the client PCs, all the small form factory machines, and then consumer markets. So they've got five markets that they have to make chips for. And none of them are small. Mm -hmm. They are in the tens, in hundreds of millions of chips that you need to make. So even to this day, I thought, well, in terms of manufacturing output capability, Intel still wins TSMC. TSMC cannot brute force make the amount of chips Intel can. TSMC can maybe make it in the smaller nodes, 
like in the 22 nanometer and the 30 nanometer and so forth for the cars and so forth. But cutting edge nodes, mm -hmm. no one can come close to Intel. Today still. Intel can out manufacturing mm -hmm. everyone. And even that's what the people like, you can't expect AMD to rock up and just take a massive amount of market share from, from Intel. Because Intel just makes more chips than anyone else. At some point, Intel made more x86 chips than ARM combined. That's Samsung, Qualcomm, Apple combined. Wow. That's how many chips Intel makes. Because that was like, imagine that. That's all your cheapy laptops. So all the Celeron laptops, all the i3 laptops, all the i5 laptops, all the i7 laptops. Go see how many laptops there are from Dell. How many laptops are from Lenovo? How many laptops are from Dell? And then it's not Asus, Acer, freaking insert name company here. And then you still need to make server chips. And that, that you make in the hundreds of thousands of chips that you just make serving. And then it's the install mm. consumer that you make. Then it doesn't even include IoT or your Nook devices and all those things. So I thought we were like, Intel is humongous. It's Intel's biggest problem. How much of a... Yeah? So how much of a downside is it for, for AMD that it relies on other fabrication facilities? Well, and uh, how much of an advantage is it that Intel has its it, own? It's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, AMD was smart where they knew they shouldn't try beat Intel where Intel is the best at. Intel is good at making right. a lot of chips. So Intel knew, okay, how do we beat them? We need to make a niche product that they cannot compete with. Mm. So that's why they made, like, and that's why, again, AMD, like, you can look at their records, the amount of chips, AMD sells everything. Like, if anything they take and mm -hmm. manufacture, they've sold. So they, yeah. they, if AMD could buy more capacity, they could. This is why yeah. later on TSMC is now making more capacity for them and AMD is becoming a competitor to, to Apple now in terms of how much capacity mm. they take because Apple normally takes majority mm. of the share. But mm. Apple's market is basically hitting a cap, I think, whereas AMD's mm. one is growing and will ever grow because it's server and it's high, high profit margins. So there's a good point with AMD because that's, it makes it easy and flexible to change stuff. With Intel, because you have such a massive market, it's difficult for them to change direction. Because if you have a massive, let's say you make a chip, you need to make that chip work with a lot of different things. You can't just make a chip to do one thing. Mm. Because you have IoT to worry about, you've got server to worry about, you have client, desktop, and laptop. That's why for most, for most of Intel's history, your laptop chips were majority the same as the desktop ones. Like literally using yeah. the same chip. You, they don't do that anymore now because things have changed now, but that was also very adva advantageous to them where you can sell your desktop chip in a laptop and made it just a bit more power efficient and there you go. You can sell it like that. So for Intel, because you're so big, it does limit you in that regard, but it also makes it, now because you're so big, it's so easy for you to make more money because Yes. And Dell can rock up to Intel and say, okay, we need 5 million chips. And Intel says, mm. sweet, when do you need it by? We can have it there in three weeks. AMD can't do that. There is no company that can do that from what I understand. Maybe when you get to Samsung with memory and so forth, but for complex CPUs and GPUs, right. this will not lead to our episode two with where AMD, where Intel can yeah. actually now, they need to start, their manufacturing needs to uptake. And now Intel's also spent a stupid amount of money getting the new stuff yeah. from ASML so that they can start keeping up yeah. and so forth. But it's now, because they're such yeah. a big company, it's difficult for them. For TSMC, it's, so we're gonna, for TSMC, it's much easier because they don't have as many factors. Yeah. So it's much easier for, in, for them to get a new EV machine, put it in, start manufacturing. They have a smaller client base, so there we go. Intel can't do that. Mm -hmm. They can't just have two EV machines. If it, they, they can't. They make too many chips. They need to have mm -hmm. at least 12. EUV machines for them yeah. to fully go for it. So that was also the yeah, kind of yeah. where you could say management fail, but it's also your, because you're not so big, you can't just buy two or three. You When you go, you have to go big. And that's one of those machines mm. is what, $200,000, $300,000 or million dollars per machine? Or more. Yeah, it's, I think it's like 200, <laughs> and, yeah, 200 million per machine. Per machine. You don't know just buy one. Yeah. One factory takes like at least like, I think it's like 12 of them. 
Yeah. And and, yeah. and ASML. then you haven't bought the people to then you don't have the engineers to run the thing yet. You've just bought the machine. You still need to have the factory and yeah. all the things that come with it. So the factory alone they think what uh, Intel spending like stupid sixty billion dollars and so forth for fabs and so forth. And I think they're only making like I think it's like how many fabs are they making? I think it's like ten I forget I the think, number, but it's about twenty billion dollars yeah, they're spending. I think in I think. total now with the chips act that I think with the new administrative there in America did now, I think it's 11 fabs that they're building in America now. Wow. I think it's 11 in America, wow. it's 7 in Europe, and it's 15 in Asia. Now, I mean Asia Pacific in terms of, of in Japan, Korea, Japan. and then in Taiwan. So they even mm. up in there, <laughs> they, but they have the most, again, in, yeah. in, that's now going with like, You've got the Samsung guys there. You've got Hynix there. So there's a lot of guys there as well. And then you've got Toshiba there as well. So there's a lot of companies there still in Asia that make stuff that not necessarily is chips, but they still need fab factories for those. Still a big and important company. Oh, and it's clear that uh, Pat Gelsinger is not flogging a dead no, horse no, no, here. There's still I a lot he, of potential I, inside I Intel. I think he, he was quite honest when he told people straight, like, we're not going to make profit for the next couple of years. Like we're spending every yeah. penny we have because if we don't, we will yeah. we will basically the company will collapse in itself. Yeah. Which is what the opposite of what they were doing for, for so many yeah, years especially in the twenty tens. They- now again, I must say they're playing much nicer now. They've not they've not really come up to the old tricks like um, they did in the old days where they would force people not to buy their stuff. But at right. least now they're more, way more honourable. And again, they're actually making good points. Mm. Twelve gen is fairly decent. Well, that's when- They've got an engineer running the show again. <laughs> yeah, that helps. I, again, it's difficult because the problem with most of those things as well, and I think Intel also fell mm-hmm. to this trap, is you need to think five to almost ten years ahead of time. So whatever yeah. you do now, like you, you're already working on stuff that you will launch in the future. And that was also maybe yeah. one of the biggest four points is because they kind of got complacent and then kind of didn't really like focus on the future – that bites you hard. Like, mm. That's why Intel's for a long time now will lose and continue losing for a bit before they'll mm. actually start becoming a good again because you can't... It takes five years to make something up again. So you can't yeah. just like on a yeah. dime, like most industries like Apple and like Google, oh, I'll just do this thing in a couple of months. It's like, no, no, no. You're out of the game for like three years, my dude. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you'll have to yeah. now <laughs> next time I can't then you can try again so that's the big yeah. problems with those things is you have to you have to have a lot of smart people knowing beforehand what to do how to make will it plan out and then then you can have it mm. so so a lot to talk about in episode two oh, of yes. Intel. Um, we, uh, we've, we're going to unpack some really interesting topics. We're going to look at Intel's decision to venture into the graphics market, the GPU market with Arc. Uh, that's their brand. Um, we're going to have a look at why they're doing that. Uh, we're also going to have a look at their latest processes. We're going to unpack in a little bit more detail their 12th gen processes and what they've done, perhaps done differently with the 12th gen uh, core processes compared to previous generations. And also I look ahead at what's coming in the 13th generation Intel core mm-hmm. chips. Quite looking forward to hearing more about that because I've done no reading on Intel 13th Gen. Um, we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at um, their um, them reinventing themselves and becoming a contract chip manufacturer, uh, which is a new hmm. thing for Intel. Um, interesting stuff to unpack there. And of course, we'll look at ARM, T- TSMC, and uh, Apple Silicon, and whether those are really going to pose a threat to to uh, to Intel going forward. Um, and of course, under underlying all of this is the big question, and that's uh, can Pat Gelsinger actually turn the ship around? Yep. So lots to talk about yes. next week. And uh, th- yeah, thanks for as always for joining the show. If you if you've got any feedback for us, we'd love to hear yep. from you. I still haven't uh, set up that joint email address yet, Gerard, but I will get around yeah. to it at some when point soon. Can. In the in, in the meantime, you are most welcome to email both of us. Uh, you can mail me at duncan at techcentral.ca.za. Gerard, what's your email address again? Gerard P at computersonly.co.za. Computers Only. And uh, the Computers Only store is in Midrand. Yeah. If you uh, if you want to go visit Gerard, uh, he uh, does a great job of building custom PCs. Um, and I uh, highly recommend him. So go check out Computers Only. Uh, as always, uh, thanks for, for tuning in. And uh, look forward to uh, unpacking more on Intel in uh, Part 2, Episode 4 next week. And what are we doing after Intel? I think we, we've got NVIDIA yes, on our list, we've got we? the big green uh, goblin. next disco. 
the Green Goblin. You're not a fan, are you? <laughs> uh, well, I've told it us there's a lot of great stuff with them, but yeah, they they are very Green Goblin. So this Goblins doesn't mean they're bad, <laughs> but we'll we'll get into that when we get to that one because there's a lot of two stuff to unpack with with Nvidia. Absolutely. Great. Well, uh, stick around. Next week, we will uh, we'll unpack the rest of the Intel story and uh, lots more to discuss on everything PC. And we'd love to get your feedback. So do mail us, duncan at techcentral.ca.za or gerard p at computersonly.co.za. Until next time, happy computing. Cheers.